I've called this talk Bible teaching about the Holy Spirit because I want us to really focus on um, what we find in the pages of this book concerning this subject. So for the next 30 minutes or so, we will just have a quick um, introduction to this subject, thinking about the background of why it's important to look at it, and think about perhaps some of the common beliefs that we see in the world around us. But the main focus of the talk will be upon what the Bible teaches on this subject. That'll be where we spend most of our time. And then towards the end, to conclude, try and think about why, why it's relevant. Why does it matter? And more personally for each of us, what does it mean we need to do in response? Why consider this subject if it doesn't matter? And therefore, what do we need to do about it? So, by way of background then, who, who or what is the Holy Spirit? And maybe just to clarify at the outset, you may see in the Bible from time to time that the phrase the Holy Ghost appears, okay? This is uh, a book that was written in the time of, of Shakespeare. And if you are familiar with some of the works of Shakespeare, you'll find that um, the, the, the phrase uh, or, the, or the word ghost is used in Shakespeare's works. Um, and he means um, spirit in, in that sense. It's not a case of, a, of a, an actual ghost or a, a kind of um, uh, a ghostly sort of being. It's just the way that it's been translated in our old English text here. If you have a more modern translation, you might have it translated a different way, but I'll be talking from the, the authorised version this evening, which is over 400 years old. And lots of the later translations, as um, some of the more recent ones, like Brother Paul was using, actually say Holy Spirit, which helps to kind of clarify the fact that there isn't this um, being or, or, or ghost. So what part does the Holy Spirit play in the work of God. How do we understand it? What is it? Well, interestingly, if you were to go to most Christian groups in the world around us, and indeed in, in this town, and Sam and I were speaking to some of them last Saturday in town, and it's very difficult for them to understand the, the, the Holy Spirit in the way that we believe the Bible teaches. Most Christian groups will follow something along the lines of the text you see there on the screen when they describe and understand what the Holy Spirit is. It's wrapped up in a, a kind of triune Godhead of the, the, the Father and the Son, the Lord Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are. To them, often you find it's part of this one being, which is quite difficult to, to kind of get your head around. So what I want to try and do this evening is rather than look at what a, a, a dictionary or an encyclopedia tells us about the Holy Spirit, I'd like us to, to look at the words of Scripture and just start in Acts where we left with Brother Paul, but just come to Acts chapter 10, please. Some words of, of Peter, because we find that the, the phrase God the Holy Spirit or um, God the Holy Ghost is not, it's not, it's not found in Scripture. And, and I think these words from Peter are quite good to remember if you come into contact with people who try and tell you that they are uh, one and the same thing. Because Peter very clearly speaks and says, verse um, 38 of Acts chapter 10, he says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Okay. So it's, to me at least, pretty simple and clear that God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit cannot be one and the same thing because that that sentence, that, that, that proclamation that Peter makes there would not, to me, make any sense how God could anoint himself with himself if you were to understand the, the, the Holy Spirit in um, common with lots of Christian groups in the world around us. And as if, and often when you speak to people, they'll explain it away as a mystery, won't they? If, if you can't get to the bottom of something... They'll say, well, it's just a mystery. We can't understand it fully. This is our best understanding of it that we can find. Well, if you carry on reading in verse 39, you see that he actually says he was a witness. Peter saw this with his own eyes. It's not a mystery at all. He saw it and he witnessed the things that Jesus did as he was in the land of Israel. 
both in the Jews and in Jerusalem. And unfortunately, as he says, they slew him and hung him on a tree. But God raised him up the third day and showed him openly. There's no mystery. There's no, nothing hidden. It's in plain sight. Peter witnessed it. He saw Jesus going about doing miracles as he was the son of God, blessed to have the spirit power of God on him to do those things. And he saw him raised from the dead again and witnessed his ascension into heaven. Not to all the people, but unto witnesses before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. So here I think it's very plain to me that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord God Almighty and the Holy Spirit are three very distinct things. So what then is the Holy Spirit? How do we understand it better if we are to look at what scripture tells us? Well, if you want to turn forward, you can, but I've put the verse on the screen. In Acts chapter 20, we see these words where it's written for us, Brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. So we as Christadelphians believe that this book, the Bible, is, is our divine instructor in life. Here we find the word of God recorded for us and from its pages we can learn of the things he has done in the past and the things that he has promised he will do in the future. We learn of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, how he gave himself as a sacrifice for us and how we then should respond in our own lives. And these, the simple guidelines we find in, in this book are sufficient for all the needs of our life. So what do we find in scripture concerning the Holy Spirit? On the screen there, I've just put a few examples. There are hundreds, but there's just nine examples of how the Bible expresses the um, and describes the Holy Spirit. You see there, it's described as the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of your Father, Jesus describes it as in Matthew the Holy Spirit of God, the power of the Lord. This is, this is where we will probably spend then the next portion of our talk, thinking about this aspect of the Holy Spirit being the power of the Lord God Almighty. And where do we find it perhaps most prevalent? Well, if you turn back to Genesis with me, to Genesis chapter 1, the first chapter in your Bible, we find that... The Lord God uses this power to create the heavens and the earth and indeed to create mankind upon it. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, having created the earth and he created mankind in verse, in, in, on day 6, well chapter 2 gives us some more details around that day and we read that the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So here then is the, the, the perhaps most important, for us at least, outworking of the spirit power of God, in the sense that he used it to create everything we see in the world around us, and towards the end of his creation, he deemed it necessary, and he was willing to create mankind, of which we are then the descendants many thousands of years later. And look at how Job describes that. He says that it was the spirit of God that made me and the breath of the Lord of the Almighty hath given me life. So we see it's, it's synonymous here then with this idea of the breath of life that we read in verse seven of Genesis chapter two. Job helps us to understand that it was through the spirit power of God that this was performed and that he gave the first man and woman, Adam and Eve, breath, and we then descend from them. Jeremiah tells us that it was he that made the earth by his power, this Holy Spirit power. He established the world by his wisdom and stretched out the heavens by his discretion. And there's a few, a couple of references there in Jeremiah, if you want to have a look at them in chapter 10 and chapter 51 of Jeremiah. So there's just a few examples of the Holy Spirit power of God at work in the creation 
of the world. Turn that back to Acts, please. We'll spend a bit more time in Acts. Come to Acts chapter 17, please. Acts chapter 17 and verse 24. Acts 17, verse 24. Here's Paul speaking when he's talking to the men and women in the city of Athens. And he speaks and he condemns them, doesn't he, for not understanding that they were so sort of superstitious and so um, caught up in making sure they didn't miss out worshipping any god they could think of. They'd even made an altar to a god that they didn't know just to make sure that he wasn't left out. And he condemns them, doesn't he? He says, you're ignorant. I'll tell you about the real god, verse 24. It's he that made the heaven, the world and all things therein. Seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't dwell in temples made with hands, neither is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. Seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. There we see the same language used that we saw in um, right back in Genesis that was picked up by um, Job. Now Paul here, when he's talking to the people in Athens, helps us to understand that it was by God's power that the world and mankind was created. He explains it very clearly, doesn't he? He made all things and he dwells in heaven. Job, again, let's, let's just think about some of his words. He says, if God set his heart upon man, if he gathered unto himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together and man shall turn again into dust. So Job's there saying, just as God gave out his breath and the Holy Spirit power created mankind, if God was to choose to take it back, then man would instantly perish and go back to the dust that originated, he originated from. We're sustained day by day through God's, uh, God's power. And again, there's some, some thoughts there from Amos on the screen. The fact that the Lord God is all-powerful and has used his power in the created world that we see around us. He, he fills his creation and he expects mankind to respond to him, having given them life in the first place. Let's just think of another aspect then of the Holy Spirit. And this is where it gets more perhaps relevant and meaningful for us when we consider this book that we have before us. The fact that it was through this Holy Spirit power that this book itself came to be written. You might question, well, how can this book of six, that 66 books all put together be consistent? How can somebody who wrote in the time of Moses understand and, and write things that are consistent with what Paul just read, we read there in Athens, or what the Apostle John would later write when he received the revelation, how can, it, how can it hang together and how can it be true? Well, the scriptures themselves explain it. Come to Second of Peter, please. Second of Peter, chapter 1. Second Peter, chapter 1, and verse 19. He says, We also have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So it's, it's quite simple, isn't it? The message of God was revealed to men and women who he deemed fit to receive it. And through his Holy Spirit power, he caused them to write the, the message that he wanted to be left for future mankind to be able to pick up and read. And we are blessed now to be able to read it even in our own language, which wasn't always the case A very well-known verse there on the screen for you in connection with this, which I'm sure even our Sunday school scholars know and have 
I've probably learned as a proof over the years. Second of Timothy chapter 3. That the Holy Scriptures are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And so even today, despite the fact that we don't have prophets um, speaking and, and using um, God's power to talk to us in the world out there or on the streets in, that we find around us, we can still open the pages of this book and read God's inspired words. And that's a real blessing that we come to learn and understand. But unfortunately, of course, there are those who choose not to. And this has always been the case and will always be the case. In times past, the nation of Israel were rebuked time after time because they had prophets sent to them directly, which we find in our Old Testament. And unfortunately, frequently, they chose not to heed and listen to the words that God sent to them. And they were rebuked. There's an example there from Nehemiah. And in Isaiah, we read that God was even vexed when he um, sent his angels, he sent his prophets to his beloved children of Israel, and they didn't give ear and respond, and they rebelled. He, Paul um, picks up on this, Peter rather picks up on this in Acts chapter 7. Let's just turn back there actually, because we've been to Acts, so we, we know where it is in our Bibles. Come to Acts chapter 7 and verse 51. Acts chapter 7, verse 51. Sorry, I said it was Peter. It's Stephen speaking here, isn't it? And we know the response of the people when they heard this. Unfortunately, they were so pricked in their conscience that they ended up stoning this man to death. Because he says in verse 51, You're stiff-necked and you're uncircumcised in heart and ears. Ye do always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do ye. So he really goes at them here, doesn't he? That they've unfortunately despite having the Lord Jesus Christ come in their own day and time, they had not listened, they were stiff-necked, just as he says your forefathers were, the people that Isaiah and Nehemiah were, were listening to in the other verses on the screen. And they, and they resisted this Holy Spirit power of God. And we do at our peril as well in, in our own day. Another aspect of the Holy Spirit, of course, is an obvious one perhaps that you've all, you're all familiar with, is the fact that with it, God allowed men to perform miracles and to give signs and perform wonderful acts using this spirit power. Here's an example of this where the psalmist records, Our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. They remembered not the multitude of thy mercies, but provoked him at the sea, even the Red Sea, Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power to be known. So in, in the time of the Exodus, again, a story that probably most people in the world around us are familiar with, where the people of Israel flee from Egypt. The wonderful power of the Lord God caused the Egyptians to perish, didn't it? But the children of Israel could pass through the sea and leave Egypt behind as it says there in the Psalms, that he might make his mighty power to be known. In the New Testament, of course, time after time, the Lord Jesus Christ himself was able to perform miracles, wasn't he? It says the power of the Lord was present to heal them. So when, when Jesus, in, the time, in, in his time on earth, was performing miracles, we understand it through that verse there in Luke was possible because he was blessed to possess the Holy Spirit power of God. The power of the Lord was present to heal them. Men came and brought someone on the bed that was sick and immediately after Jesus spoke to him, he rose up and walked. And there's many, many other examples of the Lord Jesus Christ performing miracles that we could turn to, but we'll move on for time. Turn to Romans, would you please, which is just a couple of pages from where you already are, the next book in your Bibles. Romans chapter 15, Paul's writing here, and he makes it clear how these things were done. It wasn't through any sort of 
sorcery or, or trickery. It was plainly through the Holy Spirit power of God. He says, verse 19 of Romans 15, through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, these things were done so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Elycrium, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. So here is another reference to the ability of men as we read through brother paul didn't we in Acts chapter 2 after the lord jesus christ had departed from the earth those present at the time were able received the the holy spirit it was quite a, a dramatic event where it came down visibly um, from heaven and as a result of that they could do miracles they could heal they could prophesy they could speak in different languages things which we're not able to do today but in the in the first century the holy spirit was available to them to help with the furtherance, the furtherance of the, the gospel message that more people could come to a knowledge of God and, and his plan and purpose. So here's then just a few examples of that Holy Spirit power at work. You see, it's very plain, isn't it, that it was through the his power god's power his holy spirit that these things were done the the resurrection of the lord jesus christ is perhaps the most fundamental to us as, as christian believers the most fundamental act of god's power in the sense that he raised his son our savior back to life and through our trust and understanding of that resurrection we have a hope don't we that we too um when we die we too will not stay in the grave forever. That just as the Lord God raised up our Saviour, Christ Jesus, so too we have a hope of the same thing happening to us. And we understand that it was through his power that he did this, as Paul records for us there in Corinthians. God raised him up from the dead and gave him glory. Let's stay in Romans and go to that last one there, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 and verse 3. Romans chapter 1. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. So we know that the Lord Jesus Christ, it was pronounced by God several times that this was his beloved son. He was the son of God, it was declared. But it's according with his power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead that we come to know and trust and hope in these things that's how fundamental the resurrection of the dead is to our hope and of course we could look at uh, somewhere like um, 1 Corinthians 15 in more detail if we wanted to um, to explain that further let's just turn forward to Ephesians please if you would just one more reference on this subject Re Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 19 Paul says what is the the most re remarkable powerful example I could give you of the power of the Lord God Almighty he says verse 19 what is that exceeding greatness of his power to us that believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in the world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet. It's remarkable, isn't it, that this humble carpenter's son would live a life of perfect obedience, would ultimately be raised from the dead by the power of the Lord God Almighty, that in the time to come, he will have all things under his feet. He will reign as king and everything and everyone will be subject to him. This is the, the hope we come to learn of as we start to learn 
of these things found in this inspired book. Christ has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God. Angels, powers being made subject unto him, Peter adds, which is a useful reference to have against that verse there in Ephesians that backs up what Paul is saying. Peter confirms it. The Lord Jesus Christ is now in heaven at the right hand of God. They are not one and the same being. It's very, very simple that the Lord God is his father. Jesus was his son and they are now together in heaven waiting for Jesus to come back in power and in glory when all powers, every leader in the world around us will be made subject to him. So let's go back to Acts and just think about the Holy Spirit gifts very briefly. As I said, we saw them in Acts chapter 2, didn't we? We'll come back to Acts chapter 1. We see that this was something that Jesus told his followers would happen before he ascended into heaven. He says in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, of verse 7 for connection, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And these are the last words of the Lord Jesus Christ to his disciples, the last promise that he leaves them. And straight after this, if we were to carry on reading, he he gets taken up into heaven. But sure enough, as he said it would happen, they didn't have to wait very long, did they? Because as we read in Acts chapter 2, they were to receive it. Verse, and the outworking of that, verse 6 of Acts chapter 2, is, is quite remarkable, isn't it? These fishermen and tax collectors and tent makers and all the like would be able to speak Every man heard him speak in his own language and they marvel and said, are these not Galileans? How can we hear them speak in our own tongues wherein we were born? And we have a list of all the nationalities of the people there that could hear. And what did they hear it, describe it as at the end of verse 11? We hear them speak in our language, the wonderful works of God. Fortunately, not many people in the world around us respond in that way when we try to teach them the things found in this book. Not many people I've spoken to thank me for telling them about the wonderful works of God, but it would be nice if they, if they did. And we try our best to carry on giving this message to them that they have a chance of responding in this way. And then, of course, we don't need the Holy Spirit power to, to do that, do we? We have the whole inspired word of God for us in English, and we can translate uh, tran uh, would not translate sorry communicate with them quite freely and and openly the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the holy spirit sent down from heaven is how peter describes it it's very clear isn't it this this was not men speaking anything they wanted to it was the holy spirit power of god that compelled them and instructed them on how to preach and how to teach. In, in Corinthians, Paul deals quite extensively with the Holy Spirit gifts. And unfortunately, the Corinthian ecclesia had a few problems with the fact that there were members of their ecclesia that could do certain things. And he has to um, rebuke them and kind of re-examine the facts and help them with their use of these Holy Spirit gifts. But he's, he says there, doesn't he, um, in verse, uh, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he, he lists some of the examples of what the Holy Spirit power was able to do. Some could heal and some could do miracles. Some could do prophecy and some could speak different languages. Some could understand other languages. And here was the remarkable power of God at work in the first century ecclesia. So we've kind of... I appreciate rushed perhaps through several aspects of the uh, Holy Spirit and hopefully shown that it is clearly the, the power of God. And we've looked at some of the examples of how it's been used in the past and how God willing it will be used in the future at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
But I said at the beginning, we needed to think about why it matters. What's the point of thinking about something like this? Well, just come back to Psalm 119, please, because here's a very nice verse to take away with us. Psalm 119, right in the middle of your Bibles, and verse 105. The psalmist says, Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Very simple, but very powerful, isn't it? This, this word of God can be a light to our feet. It can be through its power and through our understanding of it. We can have our footsteps guided as we go about our daily life and as we await for the Lord Jesus Christ to return. All things work together for good for them that love God, Paul tells us in Romans. And so the believer of this book places their life in the hands of the Lord God Almighty, trusting in him, knowing that everything that's going on in the world around us is in his control and that one day he will send his son back to this earth and bestow everlasting life upon all those who are found to have taken in this message and acted upon it. And so thinking of acting upon it, what about your response? Paul makes it very clear that there are two choices. There, are, there is a choice to be made with two options rather. There's one choice, two options. You can choose to be in the world or you can choose to have your mind renewed and be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he puts it this way in Romans chapter 12. He says, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed, be changed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you, James summarizes it as. And that's why it matters. I believe, because there is a God in heaven who, as we have seen, with his Holy Spirit power, has created and sustains all life. And he, in his love and in his mercy, has given all of us a chance to be with him forever in his wonderful kingdom. And so it's important that we spend the time we have available to gain a knowledge of this message and to do our best to understand it as well as we can. And so what's your response going to be? What's your response going to be? You have time available to you now that you've been blessed with. So may you use it wisely. May you choose to read from this book at every available opportunity and to take to heart the messages found in it, <coughs> that through the inspired words that you find in it, you may come to respond in the way that God wants you to in repentance and baptism, that when the Lord Jesus Christ does return, you're found to be ready and waiting for him. Thank you.